Luke chapter 2 and verses 8 through 18 this morning. Now the Christmas story is a story and a message of an extraordinary work of God. His extraordinary work to save fallen mankind. It's a powerful message. But I want to look at this message this morning from a little different perspective maybe than you've ever looked at it before. I want to look at it from the perspective of the ordinary means by which the Lord brought about this extraordinary work. Read with me our text here this morning. Luke 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out of the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, or literally a feeding trough. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a feeding trough. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it it marveled, which literally means being amazed. They were amazed at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So the shepherds declared one to another, let's go see this thing that the Lord has made known to us. So that's what I want to do this morning, is I want us to look more closely at this thing that the Lord has done, His extraordinary work. And I want to look at it from the perspective of the ordinary means by which He brought it to pass. So let's look at those ordinary means. What are they? Let me just give you five of them here this morning. The first is that God brought about this extraordinary work through simple, ordinary people. Mary and Joseph were about the most ordinary two individuals that you could imagine. They were not from royalty. They were not from the religious establishment, but... They were just regular, working individuals in a city, in a town. Well, that the scripture declares that people in that day thought nothing good could come from that town. In John 1.46, Philip went to find his brother Nathaniel. And he said, we have found Moses the one who Moses wrote about. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Just just come check out what you'll see when you meet with him. Now, if this is the case, that Jesus had parents that were just ordinary working people, I mean... That's a pretty powerful statement. It's a pretty powerful image. And I want you to think about that. And you say to yourself, well, well, so why is that so important? I believe it is a, a declaration of what and how God works. 
and how he still works today. So here is the reason why I want to look at this Christmas story from the perspective of the ordinary means by which he brings it about. Because he still is doing the same thing today. You see, the Lord chose fishermen. He chose tax collectors. He even chose a woman, a Samaritan woman. Remember in John 4 where, where Jesus spoke to this woman? I mean, the Samaritans were the most hated individuals. The Jews didn't like them. They thought, well, these people are just, you know, they're cursed by God. They're in a cult. They, don't, they aren't real Jews. But Jesus spoke to this woman, and he ministered to her. And this woman turned around and led her entire city out to see Jesus. She stirred an entire city up. This ordinary woman, hated by people, yet Jesus uses people like that. And so for this reason, I bring this point. Because he still wants to use ordinary people just like you and me today. That's the, that's the truth. That's the message of the Christmas story. Ordinary people. That's how God accomplishes his extraordinary work. And he's still doing it today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, there Paul said, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see, this is why the Lord chooses to do things in this manner. This is why he chooses ordinary things people to do his extraordinary work. So this morning, is there anything that the Lord has asked you to do that maybe you're arguing with him about? That you're saying, oh no, I can't do that. No, use somebody else. I'm just a nobody. I'm just an ordinary individual. You know, many times people say to me, well, hey, you know what, Steve, what do you expect? I'm not Paul the Apostle. Well, I don't think that anybody's a Paul the Apostle until the Holy Spirit comes upon them and uses them to do what he chooses to do. Paul was an ordinary man as well. All of the disciples were ordinary men. And he wants to use ordinary people. So what does he want to use you to do? That is part of the Christmas story. So my second thought on this subject is that God fulfilled his extraordinary work of salvation by the most ordinary of activities, the birth of a child. Do you know that there are hundreds of babies being born around the world at this very second. At this very moment, they're breathing their first breath. One of the most ordinary experiences of man, the birth of a child. I mean, without it, our, the human race would disappear. And so God chose to use the birth of a baby to reveal his extraordinary work. Such an ordinary thing. But it revealed an extraordinary and ultimately revolutionary work that he had planned. Think of it. How can God reveal himself to mankind? How does he do that? Well, he becomes one of us. That's how he does it. 
And that was the testimony of the prophecies of Scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, there Paul said, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. You see, God was manifested in the flesh. Now for me, when I, I look at the, the way that the Jews perceived their coming Messiah, it is really amazing to me that they didn't get this. You see, I see it as just a basic revelation that you should normally be able to deduce from just looking at the prophecies. I mean, you have a prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14 that simply declares, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. So this is a very simple, straightforward prediction that they all believed related to the Messiah. He had to be born to a virgin. I mean, incredible. I mean, what a sign that would be. A very simple, natural occurrence of birth. But this, a very extraordinary individual. In Micah 5, 2, it tells us where he would be born and where he would come from before he would be born. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Clear reference to the Messiah, whose goings forth are of old from everlasting. You see, he came from where what we call everlasting. Now this is the strongest Hebrew word for eternity. He came from eternity past. And so this one who came from eternity past, who lives in eternity? There's only one eternal being in in the universe, and that is God. And so here God is to be born of a virgin in a little town called Bethlehem. So how did they not get this? And yet, when Jesus claimed that he was God, what did they say to him? They said to him, you being a man are continually claiming to be God. And they took up stones to stone him. So they didn't get this. They didn't understand it. And yet, it was clearly predicted. All you had to do is just take two prophecies and put them together, and you can't miss this fact. So God chose this very simple, natural way of bringing life into the world and something that we all understand. And he did that to bring about and reveal this extraordinary work. God come in the flesh. Now, this is probably one of the simplest and yet one of the most profound differences between Christianity and every other religious system in the world. And I believe that is another reason why God chose to do this. You see, when you look at Buddhism, Buddha was a man. He lived and he died. And he is still dead today. Confucius, he lived, he died, and he's still dead today. Muhammad, he lived, he died, his tomb is still in the city of Medina today. But Jesus is totally different. Here, God came in the flesh of a man, and he lived among us, revealing who God is, what he's like, so we could see clearly and understand. This is what God is like. He lived, he died, and he rose again. You can go to the city of Jerusalem and to the tomb It is empty. He's not there. Different from any other human being that has ever lived. And so God has chosen to reveal 
his life in this way. The power of his life. And this is also the very extraordinary work that he does in every single one of us. You see, he not only came in the flesh of a man, but the scripture promises that if I will open my heart to him, he will come in and live inside of me. In John 14, 23, there Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now that is one of a multitude of promises all through the scripture where God declares, if you love me, if you obey me, you follow me. I'm going to come and I'm going to live inside of you. Christ in you is the, your only hope of glory, Paul declares. This is the only way you're getting there. And yet Christ in you is the only way that you can change or grow as a believer. It's the only way it happens. It can't happen by following a set of rules and regulations. That's not Christianity. It's Christ living in you and enabling you to change by the fact that he does live in you. Now thirdly, another extraordinary work done in a very ordinary way is God fulfilled his grandest purposes from the most humble and ordinary beginnings. Now Jesus was born in a stable in a cave. Now, just the other day I was watching a program on the History Channel where they were looking at where shepherds and how they keep their sheep and their goats today. Most of them, and if they can find a, an overhang of a rock, they will even dig it out, or if they can find a natural cave, they do, because it's a natural, easy way to protect their, their sheep and their goats. And that's exactly where Jesus was born. He was born in a cave. If you go to the city of Bethlehem today, the, the church of the nativity is built over the cave. It's a cave. That's all it is. If you look at the, the surroundings, it's just a little cave. This is where Jesus was born. Humble beginnings. Born in a feeding trough which is just basically uh, a stone that has been carved out to where animals would feed out of this trough. Not a lot of wood there in the Holy Land, so they used stone, feeding troughs. This is what Jesus used for a crib. He was born in a, a poor family that probably struggled to make ends meet just like anybody else in that day. A tough beginning, but a very natural beginning. So why do I bring this up? Why, what's the significance? Well, Jesus could have been born in a palace, or at least a nice house. But he was born in a cave, in a feeding trough. He could have had rich parents, but he just had humble, working folk for his parents. And so, didn't have a real good start in life. Now, many times people say to me, well, Steve, you know, I really haven't had a great start in life. I mean, if, if I could tell you my story, I mean, you'd realize, boy, I mean, I had a bad deal. I had a tough upbringing. It was not easy. And that's the reason why I'm struggling so today. And I always bring up to them this fact that that is not a reason for someone not to succeed in life. Just because of humble beginnings or difficult beginnings. That's not an excuse. Because Jesus did just fine. It doesn't make any difference where you begin. Success in life is determined by the choices you make along the way. That's what determines success in life and determines your eternal destiny. 
It's the choices you make today. That's what, that's what decides it all. And so if we are looking and blaming somebody else for why we are not successful today, we're kidding ourselves. We're lying to ourselves because that, doesn't, that argument doesn't hold water. God uses very humble beginnings to cause you to trust Him and to realize where, where the grace is found, where the strength will be found, where the changes really are going to be found by making choices. Let me read to you some of those choices that you need to make. The first and the most important one that determines success in life and your eternal destiny is who will you please? Will you be a, per, a people pleaser? You will not succeed if you are. Will you, be, will you please yourself? You will not succeed if you please yourself. You have to please Him. That has to be first and foremost. It has to be the number one issue. Who will you please? It says in Isaiah 56, 4, For thus says the Lord, Choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant. That's what God declares. He says, if you want to succeed, you choose to please me and please me first. Hold fast to my covenant. In other words, obey me and you will succeed. I think another great and very important decision is who are your friends? In Proverbs 20, excuse me, in Proverbs 12, 26, it says there the righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. You see, the choice of friends you have will either help you or stumble you. I believe that this is one of those fundamental choices that it's so simple, so natural. It's an everyday choice we all make. Who will our friends be? First, will I please him? And secondly, who will my friends be? And then thirdly, Will I choose to truly surrender my life to Him? In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says there, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So do you want the perfect will of God in your life? Well, here is the decision you have to make. Will you choose to please Him? Will you choose good friends? Will you choose to surrender to Him and not be conformed to this world? That's how you're going to find the perfect will of God in your life. So, Finding that perfect will is a series of decisions. It's a series of choices that you make every single day. I hope that you will make those choices that are needful. You know, the other night I was watching uh, another program. It was the CNN Heroes program. I don't know whether any of you saw that. But every year, uh, CNN chooses 10 people from around the world that they declare are heroes. It was so interesting listening to the stories of these individual people that they were honoring. One such man, he was the hero of the year. They took the ten and then they chose one of them as the, the ultimate hero of the year. His name was Efren uh, Pena Florida. And he was an ex-gang member in the Philippines. A young Filipino man, he grew up in the gangs and he decided, you know what, I'm not going this direction anymore. I'm going to get myself educated and I am going to turn my life around. And he goes around with a, a little cart and he goes through the slums of the Philippine 
Filipino cities. He has all kinds of volunteers that work with him. And he hands out books to kids to read. And paper and pencil. Things that they need to educate themselves. I mean, a powerful story. One of the other heroes, a bus driver in Queens, New York, who goes to work every day, works an eight-hour day job. Then he comes home at night, and out of his own kitchen, he cooks food for the homeless. And he and his wife and his kids go out and feed the homeless every single night. I mean, ordinary people, I mean, gang members, doesn't sound like a very good beginning. I mean, just a bus driver? Well, affecting real change in other people's lives. So, what does the Lord want to use you to do? How does he want to affect change in this world around you? That's the question. That's the Christmas story. Now, fourth, God reveals his extraordinary love in the most ordinary way and the most practical way. Again, this is the Christmas story. God revealed his love one simple way, a way, again, that everybody experiences in life, very ordinary thing. It's called death. Everybody dies. Everybody in this room is going to die. That's for sure. You think to yourself, oh, what a, what a nice thought, Steve. Thanks for that thought. But it's true. And you need to think about that because there is an eternity ahead of you. And so Christ came, he lived, born in a very natural way, but then he died. But he didn't just die naturally as everyone else died. He died for the sins of the world. He died for your sins, for my sins. He said, I will take your penalty. Because he didn't deserve it, because he didn't sin. So, that's a pretty powerful thought. Jesus said this in John 15, 13. He said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And then he turned right around that, that next day, and laid his life down. So Jesus declared that this is how he would demonstrate his love, by dying. So this is the proof that you should fix your attention on. You know, many times people say to me, well, Steve, how do I know that God really loves me? How can I be sure? I'm just not quite sure. I mean, look at this, and look at that, and If God was such a loving God, why would he let this happen and that happen? Well, I can't answer all of those questions, but all I can say to you is, I am absolutely sure God loves me. And he loves you. And he loves this world because he gave up his life for me. And he died in my place. This is what Paul said in Romans 8, 31 and 32. He says, what should we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So notice that Paul here focuses our attention upon the fact that God offered up his own son. Death. He died in our place. He says, this is he said, is what proves to me that God's for me, not against me. Again, I've heard many people tell me, you know, if God is for me, why is this happening? Why is that happening? I don't think he's for me. Oh yeah, he's for you. This is the proof. This is the proof that should seal the deal in your mind. Fix your attention on this fact. He died for you. And that is the reason why you should believe that he's for you, not against you, and that he will freely give you whatever you have need of. So ask. Please ask. So, if this is what love is all about, 
how can you experience this love? You see, the natural way that God revealed his love through Christ is the same way that you experience this love. In fact, it's the only way you can really experience his love. See, you have to die. That's what the scripture says. Now, Christians, many times, they just they don't want to die. They want to continue doing their thing. But the scripture declares it very simply. Jesus said, if any man comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So denying self. You see, I'm either a selfish person or I am a selfless person. And the more I become a selfless person, the more I experience his love. In fact, it's really the only way that you can truly experience his love. It declares in um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, let each of you look out not only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. So he's saying, become a selfless individual. And then what does he do? In verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, he uses Christ as the example of what it means to humble himself and to die. And that's what he's asking every single one of us to do. And until you do that, you can't experience the love that God wants to reveal to you. You just can't. You first have to experience it before it'll ever be given away from your life. And so this is his desire. Love is a simple thing. It's a very practical thing. Just live unselfishly. Be giving. Be kind. Humble yourself. That's where it's at. Now, fifth and last, God chose to reveal this extraordinary truth that I've just explained to you by asking us for an ordinary response. Now, probably one of the most important questions that you can answer is, what response am I talking about? What ordinary response? Well, probably the best example of this response is the shepherds, the wise men, the disciples. They all gave the response that brought the revelation of the truth that we're talking about this morning. I mean, the angels declared to the shepherds, hey, this is what's happening in the city of David, in Bethlehem. You need to go, go check this out. And they said, hey, let's go see this thing that the Lord has made known to us. So they obeyed. They listened and they obeyed. The wise men, they were given the scriptures, they were given the light of a star, and what did they do? They responded. A simple response. They follow. The disciples, they were called. Jesus said, follow me. And they obeyed. They followed him. And they turned the world upside down. So a very extraordinary work was accomplished through these individuals in just a, a very ordinary way. An ordinary response. That response of hearing, listening, obeying. It says in Revelation 3.20, Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. An ordinary response is required. If you'll hear my voice and open the door, that's a choice. That's one of those moral choices. You have to open the door of your heart and say, hey, come in. I hear you knocking on the door of my heart. Very simple. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, very simple, natural response. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart. 
I mean, that's exactly what he asked the disciples to do. Exactly what the shepherds did. They went into the town and they let everybody know what the angels had told them about this child. Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's pretty powerful. A simple response. You call on the name of the Lord. So, an extraordinary work will only take place in the heart of someone who hasn't just gives this ordinary response. Now, for those of you that are believers here this morning, those of you that are Christians, I want to I want to challenge you this morning. Are you believing the Lord to do His extraordinary work in you and through you? I hope so, because that is what He wants to do. But to do that, you have to respond to Him. You have to respond by believing in Him. You have to respond by asking of Him. That's what people do when they believe, they ask. And they receive. And then they obey. Those are very normal, simple, ordinary responses. But that is what is required. Let me show you this in the scripture in, in Matthew 9, 29. There is where two blind men came to Jesus. And they were crying out for mercy. And Jesus asked them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And he said, they said, yes, we are. We do believe that you are able. And he said, and then it says there in verse 29, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to you giving this response, a very simple response, I believe, which brings forth the action. You see, faith without works is dead, being alone. There has to be faith. And according to your faith, according to your response, will you experience the results. So, you need a response. It can't just happen all by itself. You have to respond. So are you, Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened. So I ask you, are you doing that? For those of you that are here and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian this morning, or you're not sure if you are, I want to encourage you that you must respond. If you want the extraordinary gift, the extraordinary work that was accomplished a couple of thousand years ago on a cross for you, then you have to respond. It's, I mean, Christ is not coming into your life unless you humble yourself in, and invite him in and ask his forgiveness and turn your life over to him. That's the only way it's going to happen. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens by a response, a very natural response. So is that your response this morning? I hope that it is. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we do just want to give you thanks for the extraordinary work that you have accomplished. And Lord, you did it in such a natural way. And Father, that's just to give us faith to believe that you can do that same work today. Lord, I pray that you would just open every heart of every believer here this morning to believe you for the work that you want to do in them and through them. Lord, use us, just very ordinary people, to do that extraordinary work in these last days. Give us that heart, Lord, to seek you, to ask of you, to knock on your door, and to keep on knocking until we receive it all. Lord, we believe you to do that this morning. Lord, I pray that you would raise every believer up here this morning. Make them men and women 
that are going to do extraordinary things in your behalf. Lord, give them those words to speak, that love, that wisdom, those gifts that only you can give. We believe you to do that, Lord. And for those of you that are here this morning that don't know Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right where you sit this morning. If you believe that Jesus died for you, if you believe that you're a sinner, and you believe that you want to follow him, if you want to turn from your way of living and follow him, then I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to make that confession. I want you to call out to him and ask him to do that work inside of you. If you want to do that, pray with me right now. Say these words. Just say, Lord, forgive me. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I want to be your disciple. For those of you that are praying that prayer with me this morning, I want you to just acknowledge that you prayed with me by just lifting your hand. You're a simple acknowledgement. God bless you and you. Who else this morning? God bless you. Lord, I ask you to just touch these hearts, touch these lives in just such a powerful way. Reveal yourself to these. Lord, we believe you are, even at this moment. Let your spirit just fall upon them. Bring that life, that joy, that power that only you can give. We believe you to do that, Lord. We thank you for just working your extraordinary work of salvation here in our midst, even this morning. We ask it and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.